All right, thank you all for being out here on night two of our uh, camping trip. It's good to see everybody out here with us this evening. And thank you again, Pastor Thompson, for doing those sword drills, trying to make it a little bit more fun. You guys get a little bit more excited. I mean, come on. <laughs> I guess they're all pooped from the day. I mean, we had too much fun out playing, riding their bikes, and, and swimming and everything else. So uh, appreciate everyone being out here this evening. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter number seven, Luke and chapter number seven. I'm trying to get the live stream set up. There's some Wi-Fi out here, but I'm having some technical difficulties, so it's not going to happen tonight. I'm hoping to get it up for the rest of the week, though. Luke chapter number seven. Uh, as we always do, we're going to read the entire chapter. You can follow along silently while I read. Bible reads starting verse number one. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much of people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier. And they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet has risen up among us, and that God had visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men that were come unto him, excuse me, when the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what are they like? They are like unto children, sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. 
For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. He would, excuse me, but wisdom is justified of all her children. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with, his, with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have tonight to gather together. God, we thank you for making all this possible for so many people, so many uh, brothers and sisters in Christ to be here uh, tonight. And I pray that you would please bless this time that we have together. Bless the whole time, Lord. Bless the fellowship and, and just strengthen our relationships here, dear Lord. And I pray that you would just fill me with your spirit tonight. Lord, help me to preach in truth and in power and in boldness, dear Lord. And I pray that uh, there'd be a lot of good that would come out of the preaching of your word and that your word would sink in deep, and Lord, and that we'd all be able to, to pay attention and stay focused. Uh, I know we, we, this is a, a little bit of a different setting. We're outside, Lord, but uh, I pray that you would please just help us all to stay intent for the short time that, uh, that we're going to be preaching from your word. And God, I love you. We all love you here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I thought it was only appropriate to preach a sermon tonight and this was this is what was just kept going through my head because you know as we're going out to camp in the wilderness and you got all this preaching every day I saw you know the name of my sermon is what went ye out for to see and this is what you know Jesus Christ was saying unto the Pharisees and saying, you know well what did you go out to see what did you go out in the wilderness for to see of course this is a Baptist camp this is a Baptist church camp that we're having right now uh, strong old Baptist Church is here, Sword of Spirit Baptist Church is here with us, and we're Baptists. We believe in Baptist doctrine. We believe in the fundamentals of the faith, and um, you know, what a better person to highlight than John the Baptist at a Baptist conference, at a Baptist event, right? And, and here's one of the things that's very distinctive. There's a lot of things that are distinctive. I'm not going into all the Baptist distinctives tonight, but... One of the things I love about John the Baptist is just the little bit that you get to understand about who he is. And we understand that about a little bit about who John the Baptist is just from these few verses uh, here and in a few other places where Jesus is, is um, you know, asking him, look down there. Well, let's, start, let's reread this passage. We just read the whole chapter. Let's reread this part right here. Verse number 22 says, Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf ear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. Now, one quick note on this, and, and this is one of the things that Jesus Christ gives us such a great example of. Okay, John the Baptist, for whatever reason, had a moment of doubt when he was in prison. Right? Now, I conjecture that one of the reasons why John might have been doubting about Jesus 
is because he had a different expectation of what Jesus was going to do when he came to this earth. A lot of the believers at that time thought that the Christ was going to set up an earthly kingdom because they were conflating the first coming of Jesus Christ with the second coming of Jesus Christ. They didn't quite understand how all that was going to play out like we do today. So I think that might be some of the reason why he was doubting a little bit. But here's one of the things that I love about Jesus Christ, right? He, he confirms it. He's like, look, tell, tell him everything you've seen and heard. Tell him all these things because he'll know that that's the, that is the, the confirmation of the prophecy and uh, just kind of edify him and build him up. And then after he says that, he says in verse 23, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. And then he's here praising John the Baptist. Right? And I love that about Jesus Christ. You know, people, really good men of God might have you know, these points where they're, they're not quite perfect, right? Or they have a little bit of misunderstanding. And Jesus isn't going, what do you mean you don't believe? You know, he's not flipping out over some of these things that he knows it's a smaller issue. He just needs to be encouraged, needs to be edified. And then he goes and turns and praises John the Baptist. And, you know, this is what you, you, get, you get to do, you know, a couple different things when you see some faults in somebody. Right? You can, you can hammer on them. You can talk to other people about them. You can complain about them. Or you can, you know, show some grace and mercy and look past that and still praise good people. And John the Baptist was a good guy. He's a great guy. In fact, Jesus Christ himself said, Among them that are born of women, verse 28, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there, hath not, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Talk about a great preacher. But that's what Jesus said. But look at how Jesus describes John the Baptist. Verse number um, 24. He starts talking about John the Baptist when he says, uh, And when the messenger of John were departed, he began to speak on the people concerning John. What went ye out for? What went you out into the wilderness for to see? So what did you go out there to see? When you went out and you heard about this big commotion, about John the Baptist, he's preaching out. Man, we got to see what's going on out in that wilderness. This John the Baptist guy, what did you go out there to see? He says, a reed shaken with the wind. The reason why, what's a reed? He's like, you see someone just, just going with the wind, just, just, just having his doctrine, just, just blowing about, every wind of doctrine, just, just whatever people want to hear. Look, that's not John the Baptist. John the Baptist wasn't spineless. He doesn't just get this, this force, any type of, of oncoming force, like he's describing like wind, where reeds are just kind of bending over, blowing over. John the Baptist is standing strong in the wilderness. Amen. He's got a backbone. A reed shaken with the wind. But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? What did you expect to see? Some cupcake? Some little, uh, you know, someone, oh, you know, I'm a little bit dirty. Right? Like, hey, we're on a camping trip. And I appreciate people, you know, I've, I've had a few questions on what's the, you know, what's the dress standard like. And, and I understand that, you know, especially guest preachers, they don't, they want to, they don't want to be offensive. They want to be uh, very um, appropriate, right? But here we are. I mean, we're out in the wilderness, right? What, when you come out here to see, we're not, we're not dressing in soft raiment. This is, this is where we're at, right? It's not, it's not about the dress. It's about the message. It's about the word of God. Obviously, we, we show respect in the house of God, we, and, we, and we show respect to the Lord, and we try to, to appear our best. But look, ultimately, you know, we're Baptists, and what matters most of all is the message, the Word of God. That's what we're here for. And Jesus said, what did you go out expecting to see? Do you expect to see a reed? Do you expect to see someone who's getting pushed around? Do you expect to see someone in soft raiment? He says, behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. John the Baptist was not some you know, nobleman raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. He's out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. He's got a leather belt about his loins, okay? He's out there just preaching the word of God in the wilderness. This is who John the Baptist was. He's a rough guy, rough, rough on the outside, right? But what won't he out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I send you in much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And as Baptists, you know, we're supposed to be out there preparing the way for people. Obviously, he was preparing the way for Jesus Christ, but we're preparing the way for people to be led to Jesus Christ. 
And we need, we need good, old-fashioned Baptist preaching like John the Baptist. John the Baptist wasn't afraid to step on any toes, by the way. In fact, John the Baptist was beheaded because of his preaching. Beheaded because of preaching. He was beheaded because, for, for Herodias' sake, Herod's uh, brother Philip, was was married to a woman and John and, and he wanted her and he coveted her and he ended up marrying her and we don't know all the details about that but the Bible teaches us that you know if you're to get divorced and remarried that you're basically committing adultery Amen. does anyone believe that here Amen. But Jesus Christ said except to be for the cause of fornication that if you, if you put away a woman and you marry another, that you're committing adultery. Right. It's what the Bible says. It's what the Bible teaches. And yeah, I know, today it's offensive. It was offensive back then too. And in fact, John the Baptist was beheaded for it. Herod didn't like that. But you know what? He didn't, he didn't hold back and say, well, I mean, Herod's done this. I, I better not say anything about it because I might get in trouble. That's not, what, what did you go out in the wilderness for to see? Someone who's just going to lay down and, and not preach the truth? Well, hopefully, you know, when you come here, you're going to hear from a lot of people, a lot of Baptists. Amen. None of them made John, John, but, you know, we've got, well, there is one. We have, sorry, sorry, Jonathan. I think it's John, Jonathan, right? It's not J-O-H-N, though, so we don't have a John. We've got, we've got Jonathan the Baptist. We've got Aaron the Baptist, right? We've got Ed the Baptist, we got Stephen the Baptist. We're going to have Roger the Baptist. Jason. Jason the Baptist. Thank you. I'm like, I know there's one more and my brain's dead. And I'm a Baptist. Amen. And what did you come out here to hear? Hopefully you came out here to hear the word of God. Hopefully you came out here to hear from people who are not going to back down. Hopefully you came out here to hear from people who are willing to, to preach the word of God and not just be some reed shaking in the wind. But what happens is people get offended. Look what Jesus said in verse 23. He said, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. You ought not to be offended by the word of God. You know, fundamental Baptist preaching is often referred to as hellfire damnation preaching. Right? You know what I say? Amen. Yeah. Amen. You say, why do you rip on sin? Why, why do you always got to be harping on sin? Why do you got to be yelling and screaming? Why? Because the Word of God is important and because, you know, people, all of us, me included, need to sit down sometimes and just hear the Word of God Amen. thundered forth and just be told, hey, thus saith the Lord. Amen. And someone, you know, we all need to be set straight from time to time. And you're going to need someone who's not going to beat around the bush, who's not going to be kind of blown around in the wind. You're going, well, what is he really saying? I don't know. It just sounds like everything's kind of okay. You need someone who's just going to take the Word of God and say, look, this is what the Bible says. Adultery is a sin. Remarriage from, from divorce is a sin. You know, all these various things are sins, and, and you ought not to do them. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. We, we get a good picture of who these, what, what Bible-type preachers were like. We get a good picture of what Jesus Christ himself was like based on the testimony of others, even people who weren't his followers. There's a testimony of Jesus Christ and how men of God were in, in Bible days. We saw, you know, John the Baptist wasn't, he, he wasn't just dressed gorgeously. He wasn't, he wasn't backing down. He had a backbone. He had a spine. He was willing to say the things that need to be said regardless of how it was received. And go ahead and go through all of the prophets. Read your book. Read the Old Testament. Read these preachers that would preach the word of God. Read about Jeremiah. Read how, read how he was you know, lowered down into the dungeon because of what he preached. Read about Ezekiel. Read about you know, Isaiah and Elijah and Elisha. And, and you can see all of the trouble and persecution that they faced. But you know what? They never backed down. None of them did. They never did. They always preached the truth. They always preached what God told them to say. 
You don't need someone tickling your ears today. You need someone preaching your ear the Word of God. Amen. Matthew 16, look at verse number 13 and 14. The Bible reads, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he's basically saying, What are people saying about me? Who do people think I am? And their response was this, and they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. So right there we see that Jesus was a preacher like John the Baptist. People were confusing him, thinking that, oh, this is John. Because Jesus started his ministry basically as John was ending his ministry. So they're thinking, well, John was beheaded. Maybe this is like a reincarnation of John the Baptist. And they says, uh, some Elias, which would be like Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So they're saying to Jesus, man, he's just like some of these real hardcore preachers from the Bible. This is who Jesus was. And, you know, one of the things that John the Baptist read, what do you preach? Repent. Repent. And, you know, for people, repent isn't a very positive message because it's telling you to turn, to change. Now, look, let's make this real clear. And I know all of you here, as far as I know, believe right about this. When John the Baptist was preaching repent when it comes to salvation... He was pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't telling them, you got to give up all of your sins in order to be saved. John the Baptist was telling people, repent. Why? Because they weren't putting their faith in Christ. Their faith was in whatever. It was anything but Jesus Christ. They had their faith in the law of Moses. They had their faith, which wasn't really the law of Moses. I mean, they didn't really understand the word of God. They had their faith in any other religion. They had their faith in themselves. They had their faith in how good they were, their own obedience to the law. But they didn't have their faith in, in the Savior. Yeah, that's right. So they needed to change. They needed to repent. They needed to put their faith on Christ. But you know what? He wasn't just preaching that. I'm sure he was preaching a lot of other sermons about repentance. And look, we all ought to be repenting daily. You need to change. You need to get the sin out of your life. Whatever sins you got, you know, whatever bad doctrine you got, whatever bad beliefs you got, you got you to change. We got to get it right with God. You got to repent. And that's not going to be received well. But this is how Bible preachers do it. Flip over, if you would, real quick to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah, another great example of a great man of God, a great preacher of God's word. Talk about some Christ-like preaching right here. Isaiah 58, we're going to look at that, that very famous verse right there, verse number one. The Bible says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. You say, why are you Baptists always yelling? Well, the Bible says right there, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Hey, cry aloud. Spare, spare not means don't withhold. Don't hold anything back. Let it all rip. You know, I know a long time ago, when I, you know, after I got saved and I was looking for a good church, I'd be visiting different churches periodically. You know, I was a, I was a real watered-down Christian. I was real uh, lame, as it were, before I got plugged into a good church. Because I, when I got saved, I didn't start going to church right away. I, uh, it took me a while to find a good church. And I go to these churches. I go to church services. I listen to preaching. And it's always just like, why, why does it seem like you're holding back? You hear preaching and be like, why, why don't you just come forward and say it? And you read these parts of Scripture. It's like, oh man, this is awesome. I'll be learning. I'm reading as we're going through. And the preacher's going a different verse or whatever. And, and I'm reading this. And I'm going, wow. If you, you know, if you could move past that verse, the very next verse, like... There's so much more you can be saying here, and it just always felt like preachers were holding back. Of course, the very next verse, oftentimes, something might be controversial. And people just don't say it. You know what the Bible says? We're not supposed to hold back. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. So you're going you're gonna to go out into the wilderness... Hopefully hear some preaching and expose your sin to you, not to tear you down, not to just make you feel bad because, you know, these preachers just love making people cry and making them feel bad. Look, that's not the point. If you get grieved by the preaching, the only hope that we have is that it's, that it's, that it's uh, sorrow that leads to repentance. 
And you can read all about that. The Apostle Paul describes in detail from a preacher's view of, of preaching on sin, how he's like, you know, I was, I was sorry. At first he said he was sorry that he even wrote that first letter because he really laid into him. He really rebuked him hard. But he said, you know what, I repented, but, but I don't repent. You know, he said later, I, I didn't, you know, I changed my mind is a good thing. Because even though you were sorry for a season, you know, that sorrow worked repentance in you. And they got those things right that need, needed to change. And that's the whole point, and that's the purpose of going out in the wilderness and hearing a John the Baptist preach the Bible so you can hear the Word of God, you can hear it clearly, you can hear it without any beating around the bush and someone is coming straight forward and saying it. And look, you either receive it or you don't. Now in Isaiah 58, God's commanding Isaiah here essentially how to preach and, and, and to show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. But there's a big problem with the people here on how they're going to receive it. Because if you are there, if you're sitting and listening to preaching and you're thinking, well, I don't really have any sin. I'm just pretty much right on everything. You're not going to receive any rebuke very well. Right. You just think, well, well I'm, I'm good. And, and let me tell you this. If you go to church year after year and you've got people preaching to you that, that, are, that are good, you're listening to preaching, and you never hear anything that kind of stings you or pricks you, it's like, oh, man, you know what? I, I, need, I need to do something about that. You need to check yourself. If you're not hearing any preaching, you're not hearing in your own reading and everything else, and you're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. And you could read and read and read and read and read and hear all preaching, preaching, preaching. You got a problem. And it might be bigger than you think. It might be a lot bigger than you think. And, and, and it's really time to take a deep dive inside and check it out. Look at verse number two here in Isaiah 58. The Bible reads, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness. So he's saying, the people are acting like they're righteous. They're saying, hey, they're seeking me daily. They're, they're, they delight to know my, my ways like a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. This is, their added, this is where their mind is at. This is what they're thinking. Verse number three. They say, wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. They're saying, well, wait a minute. Why are we fasting? And, and it's like you're not, you're not hearing us, God. You don't see our fast? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? They say, well, and we're doing all this stuff, God. Where are you? How come you're not hearing us? They think that they have no problem. They're doing everything. Right, but we're fasting. You know, just like when the disciples... You know, the, 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 the Pharisee, well, I fast twice in the week, you know, and, and I thank you, God, that I'm not like this publican over here, right? This is the same attitude. This is the attitude that the children of Israel had. They just thought that they were just so perfect and so great, and they didn't do anything wrong. And it's a proud attitude, but that's not reality. The Bible keeps going here in verse number three. Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. So God is saying right off the bat, you're not doing it right, first of all, because you're just doing all your, you know, the fasting is supposed to be a time of afflicting your soul. It's supposed to be a time of, of, of you know, deep, serious prayer and just affliction on yourself. That's why you're withholding things from yourself. It's not just about, well, I'm just not going to eat something, right? It's, it, it, the food is part of it, but the whole point is to afflict yourself and to withhold pleasure from yourself, basically withhold all pleasure. And he's saying here that, you know, the day of your fast, you're finding pleasure and you're just doing all your work. It's just day to day for you. Behold, ye fast, and then, and then the reason why is that you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? So they're saying, look, they're pretending like, yeah, we love the Lord. We love God. Everything's great. We're fasting. But God, how come you aren't hearing our fast? How come you're not answering our prayer, God? And he's saying, look, you're fasting for strife and debate. 
And then he says, is it the fast? I, is, this the, is this what I've chosen for you to fast? Is this how I've chosen for it to be done? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. See, they got caught up on, on these small details, exactly like the Pharisees who say, well, we pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Jesus said, but you, you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, you know, judgment, faith, mercy. You know, these things ought you have done and not to leave the other undone. When people get so full of themselves and lifted up in their pride, they think everything's going great and they can't even see the, the forest for the trees. They can't even see the big picture. They can't see, you know, that they're really, it's like the church at, um, what church was that in Revelation where, where they, they, you know, they think they're rich. They've got all their goods, right? He says, but you're poor and miserable and wretched and blind and naked. What church? Sardis. Sardis? I'm going with that. <laughs> I'll look it up later. The Church of Sardis, where they, you know, they thought that everything was great, but spiritually, through through the, through the lens of God, through the lens of the Word of God, they were miserable. They were poor. They were blind. They were naked. They needed they needed a lot more than they thought. They thought everything was good. Flip over if you would to Ecclesiastes chapter number five. preaching of Isaiah, just like the preaching of John the Baptist, just like the preaching even of Jesus Christ, doesn't go over well with a lot of people. And one of the reasons why is because people can't take rebuke or correction. People just don't take it very well. They think they know better. They think they're great. They think everything's just fine. And as it's, it's the result of pride. I love what Ecclesiastes says here. You know, when, when, you're, when you're getting ready, you know, this week, when you're, when you're out in the wilderness, getting ready to hear, we should take the advice of Ecclesiastes 5. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. This is obviously in reference when, you know, if you're going to go to church, you, know, you don't just go to, like, to offer up your sacrifice. You better be ready to hear. Because that's what God wants from you. God wants your obedience. God wants your ear. God wants your heart. God wants you listening. God wants you learning. God wants you changing your life way more than he wants you putting a bunch of money in the offering plate. Right. Way more than he wants you just offering up some great sacrifice. Oftentimes, he doesn't even ask you to do, right? There's things that just people will just do. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to do all of this for God and I'm going to give all this and I'm going to donate that and, and whatever. And it's like, how about you just start by, by listening to the Word of God? Just listen to what God has for you and, and don't be so caught up in, in all these great sacrifices that you're making. Just be obedient. The Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. Be ready to hear. When, you, when your foot goes to the house of God, be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, Be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. And this is something I think that all of us ought to be able to swallow down and think about and meditate on being not rash with your mouth. What does it mean to be rash with your mouth? It means you're, you're, you're letting words come out way too easily. You're speaking too quickly. You're not giving the proper thought and attention, oftentimes people let emotions take over and end up saying things that you ought not to say. But in, the, in, the, you know, in the abundance of words, there wanteth not sin. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let, thy, let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. 
Verse 3, for a dream coming through the multitude of business and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Flip over, if you would, to Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, we got the famous parable of the sower. And of course, you know, I'm not going to go through the entire parable. We got the seed that's the word of God being sown. Some is on stony ground, some falls by the wayside, some is on stony ground, some is on a good ground, right? And it gives all these different examples and how there's basically, when, when that new life is created, that, that some of it gets choked out, the cares of this world and the riches and other things just come along and they get people out of serving God. They, they make people become unfruitful in their service. But then, of course, is that they're sowing on the good ground and starts bringing forth fruit and just doing a lot for the Lord. That's the parable. But what Jesus says, and I love this verse in verse number, um, we'll start reading in verse 16. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a barrel, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. And what I love about that verse, it says, be careful how you hear. How you hear. How you hear can determine how fruitful you are. We, we, the, the, you know, the parable of the sower is talking about being fruitful ultimately. Like we want to be those that, are, that have the good ground, right? You, you, you're, you're, uh, the soil's been plowed, everything's ready to go, and you can be very fruitful. Just like you know, you've got this candle, you're saved, you've got, you've got uh, the, the gospel within you, you've put your faith in the gospel, and we ought to shine the light of the gospel. And we, you know, the more you know the Word of God, you ought to be a light, a brighter, shining light, and we're not supposed to hide that. And he, he kind of summarizes all this in saying, you know, take heed how you hear. Because how you hear, are you ready to hear or are you closed off? Are you, are you anticipating? And look, you ought to be able to, if you've got someone who's saved up preaching, you, if you are hearing right, if you are ready and you are open and you are willing to receive anything that God's going to pour out, they don't have to be the best order. They don't have to be the most dynamic. They don't have to be the most exciting or maybe the best with their words, but you ought to get something out of that preaching right. because you're ready to hear, because you're going to pay attention. You know, some people, look, I get it. I've, I've heard a lot of preachers and I know that I don't have all the best skills either, so that's why I'm going to focus on this a lot more because <laughs> to get you to, to understand that it doesn't have to be, you know, this, this perfect person preaching or, oh, well, this person's way more entertaining. I like them or, you know, great. You can like whoever you want, but how about you're just ready to hear the word of God and ready to make the application to yourself and learn as we're going through these scriptures. I, I mean, I've gone into, uh, heard all kinds of different preaching and, you know, you ought to be able to walk away learning something, being edified by something, have, have something, have some type of impact through the Word of God. Sometimes it's easier than others, sometimes it's harder than others, but when you're ready to hear, when you've got yourself ready, you're focused, you're, you're intent, and you want to learn, you know, that is going to have a big impact on how fruitful you become because you're ready to hear. Be careful how you hear. Why didn't the Pharisees hear John when he was out in the wilderness and preaching to repent? Why didn't they hear him? They didn't hear him because of their pride. They didn't hear him. As we already saw, I went over this you know, multiple times in Isaiah 58, but we see this over and over again. 
they think that they can't be taught. You know, someone who can't be taught, someone who knows everything can't be taught, right? People are lifted up at pride. You, I, my favorite is when you go out soul winning and you have someone, you know, you're trying to explain the gospel to them. It's, oh, I already read the Bible. Like, you read it one time. Oh, now you know all about it. Oh, I don't need, I, I already know, I, I already read the Bible. And then you ask them, well, what does it take to be saved? And they can't answer you. Now, I, I mean, obviously it's kind of funny, but here's the thing. Don't let yourself get in a condition like that where you can't be shown anything from Scripture. Where, where, you, where you just end up being as foolish as that person is because you're stiff-necked about whatever, anything that the Word of God, and you know, it could be anything. It could be any doctrine. It could be anything. But usually, usually, the reason why people have this type of pride, it's, it's, it's very specific to something that you're doing wrong. Because you don't want to be told that you're wrong about that thing. And those are the areas that are going to sting the most and are going to get people to, to clench up and, and not want to hear it and have it be real rough. But you know what? You ought to be ready for that. Get ready in advance and just be like, you know what? We're going out in the wilderness and, and hopefully you're going to rip my face off. Amen. And then rip it off again and then rip it off again. And I'm ready for it. Pharisees didn't want to hear John because of their pride. The truth is, Jesus and John and the disciples had way more wisdom and knowledge than all the Pharisees put together. I mean, they, they thought they had their education. They thought they were so smart and they had all this stuff, right? And they had all their degrees, I'm sure. And, oh, these people who are ignorant, they know not the law. You know, these people are cursed. These people are damned. These people don't know anything. And it's because of that very attitude, they weren't ready to hear from God. They thought they knew it all. We need to be ready to hear. And, you know, I'm going to throw this in here as well. Turn, if you would, to um, Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. We have, we have until Saturday, we have all pastors preaching at this conference. And, you know, some of the pastors are preaching here I know better than others, but I feel like I know all of them pretty well. And the Bible teaches that in order to even be a pastor, that you can't be a novice, right? Now, not, I mentioned before, not every pastor has the same skill set. Some are better at different things than others. Some people are better preachers than others. Some people are better explaining things, you know, than, than, than others. But... None of us here are novices or beginners at, at, you know, counseling, at preaching, at knowing the Bible. Now, everyone that I'm aware of doesn't have a pharisaical attitude, but the, the truth of the matter is the Bible says that you can't be a novice even to order to be ordained. If you're biblically, scripturally ordained, you're not going to be a novice. When you hear rebukes and when you hear teaching from God's word from a pastor, take it for what it's worth. Especially from people that you know and the more you know someone and the more you see the fruit of their labor and the more you see the fruit of, of their ministry. And if you see good fruit there, look, take that to heart. Because when you get rebuked, when you get told that you're wrong, when you hear something that you just like, it upsets you, makes you angry, whatever. One, the reason why we even do this is because we love God and we love you. Amen. The reason why we rip face is because it's for your benefit. Because I know for me, it helped me out tremendously. I love the hard preaching. I love being told that I was wrong. You don't like it exactly necessarily right when it happens, but it helps make you to be so much of a better person. It helps you grow so much more. And if you love God and if you love the truth and if you love the light, you're going to want to walk in the light and get the darkness slapped out of your life. But try to, try to take the rebuke, especially from your pastor, well, right? Don't, don't, just, uh, don't, don't get too puffed up against, against your preacher, against your pastor. John was a strong leader. 
And that, that's another thing. John, John got a following, right? Out in the wilderness. He, made, he was making a name. He was, he was causing a stir. Now, the, you know, John wasn't making it all about himself, which again was evident when, as, as Pastor Ed said yesterday, you know, he, he made reference to the verse, he must, you know, I, I must decrease, but he must increase. Because the whole point is that John the Baptist was trying to point people to Jesus Christ. And that's what all of us are doing here today. Right. We're trying to point people to Jesus. We're on the same team. And we don't want to make these factions like uh, in 2 Corinthians, the Bible saying, you know, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas and I'm of Christ. Right? You've got all these people, all those people loved God. They loved Christ and they were following Christ. But unfortunately, you know, oftentimes people just try to get stuck in these, these cults of personalities or whatever. And they want to make more out of the man than, than out of the message. And we're here today and, and one of the things that, you know, that I know that all my friends I, that I invited here, they're strong leaders. Now, are, is, are they perfect? No. I'm not perfect. They're not perfect. You can't expect perfection out of people. Right. But you know what? When you're a member of a church, you need to follow the leadership that you have. Right. And you need to humble yourself. Even in those instances where you might think they're wrong on something, hey, look, you know they love God. You know that they love you. You know that they're doing a good work. You know what? Follow the leader. Right. Follow the leader. Follow them as they follow Christ. How about you get yourself in submission and obedience? Instead of going around and complaining to other people about it and gossiping and spreading rumors, why don't you just follow the leadership? When you get rebuked, just take it. Amen. Just take it. Even if you think you were done wrong, suck it up. Funny thing about a strong leader, the people love strong leaders until you're the one that's getting the rebuke. Right? Like, oh man, I love coming to church. This is great. Yeah, you're ripping on the fags. You're ripping on this. And then all of a sudden, boom, they hit you. And then all of a sudden, it's, yeah, I'm not ever coming back to this church again. <laughs> Look, you need to be ready to hear. You need to be ready to hear. Hopefully, you're not just, go you're not just going out into the wilderness like a Pharisee to see the, the sideshow, right? What is, what, what's Pastor Anderson going to say next? And just, and just, you know, grab some popcorn and like, it's just, it's just an entertainment thing. Be ready to hear. Be, be ready to apply the word of God from all these preachers. And I hope we got some face ripping coming up by somebody. Because... That's what I want to hear. <laughs> I know I didn't tell you guys that we had any type of theme. I should have said face rip is the theme. <laughs> Did I have you turn to Proverbs 11? If not, turn there. Turn to Proverbs 11. I close on these two, two Proverbs we're closing on. I just want to close on this thought too because The, the things of God, you know, wh while there's so much complexity and, and eternal things that you, could, you, know, you can gain out of God's word and how infinite the wisdom is. On, on one hand, it's still very simple. And, and what I mean by simple is just, it, it's not complicated. Like, like what God has for us to do in this world and, and the way that we all live our lives is not complicated. It may be difficult to do, but it's not complicated. Doing good, doing right, you know, the things that God has for us to do, it's very simple. We need to make sure we don't complicate those things with, you know, we need to get ourselves out of the way sometimes and just, and just get over it, get over ourselves and ultimately have a humble spirit and a humble attitude. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, verse number two, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. So when you come ready to hear, you got to come lowly. Because that's when the wisdom's going to come. You come with pride, you're not going to be able to receive what, what's being taught in the Word of God. It's just going to lead you to shame. 
Because if you're, if you're wrong about the Word of God, if you're wrong in an area of your life and you need to be corrected, you're not willing to take that correction, it's going to end up to your shame. I mean, just the way it works. The sin's going to bring you into shame. And then flip over to Proverbs chapter 3. The Bible says, but with the lowly is wisdom. And in Proverbs chapter 3, the last two verses of Proverbs chapter 3, Verses 34 and 35, the Bible reads, Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. We need to make sure that we're coming, going out to the preacher, going out to hear the word of God, lowly, ready to hear, you know, be careful how you hear because it's only going to help you. Be, be paying attention and, you know, really stay focused and, and follow along in your Bibles when, when passages are being turned to. I can't tell you how many times I've learned things from verses surrounding the one that was turned to. And, and I mean, I believe it's the Holy Ghost that's teaching you things. You could have thoughts. You know, everyone's got different things going on in your mind as it applies to you and your life. I don't know these things. There's been, I don't know how many times I preach sermons and people come up to me and said, you know, Pastor Burson, you know, this was going on and this was going on. And I'm just thinking like, I had no idea. And I'm preaching on these topics or preaching through these verses. And oftentimes people are just coming back and telling me other things that while I was preaching, you know, this verse came to mind. And I was just like, yeah, great. That also applies. And this is, you know, there, there's so much more there. My point is to be, to be following along. These sword drills are great. Thanks for doing that, Pastor Thompson. Getting people quick to know where the books are in the Bible, be able to turn there quickly, be able to reference this stuff so that when the preacher's going and if they're, they're going through and kind of shotgunning through and rattling off all these verses, you can be keeping up with them right there and getting the Word of God because that's, I mean, that's, that's what we need. That's where the power is anyways. Amen. Power's in the Word of God. So hopefully you're ready to hear the rest of the week. And, uh, you know, if, if you get your face ripped off, praise God. Let's bow our eyes that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. We thank you for this group of Baptists out here in the wilderness. Lord, I pray that you would please just uh, help us all to be edified and encouraged and motivated to do better, to do right. Dear Lord, I pray that you would please keep us humble and... Um, and just keeping our nose to the, to the ground and doing the work that you set before us, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.